Hello and welcome to Nothing But The Truth. You can't have failed to notice how Sanjay Baru's biography of Dr. Manmohan Singh, the accidental Prime Minister, has created a storm of controversy. It's all over the newspaper front pages. It dominates television news. Now with me to talk about the book, as well as the criticism he faces, is the author himself, Sanjay Baru. Sanjay Baru, let's start with some of the searingly honest comments you make about Dr. Manmohan Singh. You write, many believe that in not asserting the authority inherent in his office, he devalued it, his willingness to be pushed around by his party and coalition partners, and to have his decisions publicly challenged by Rahul Gandhi, irretrievably damaged his image. The impression that creates in my mind is of a good but weak man. I think that's a fair impression. I mean, he was certainly a good man. And I've said in the book uh, that he was also a good prime minister in the sense that he was an effective leader of policy, uh, both domestic policy and foreign policy. I think where he failed, and I've, that is the criticism I have in the book, is in being a political leader. And I've said it repeatedly that the prime minister in this country is not just head of government. He is, in fact, head of the country. He is the, he is the personification of the sovereignty of this country. And that's where Dr. Manmohan Singh failed. He did fail there. And that's where his weakness showed. Absolutely. Now, in fact, in your book, you quote a conversation you had with him where he says, there cannot be two centers of power. I have to accept that the party president, that Sonia Gandhi, is the center of power. He readily accepted that he was subordinate to her and treated himself as junior to her. Yes, and this was justified in the, in the initial period. I remember Sitaram Yachuri actually saying to me, but you know, this is how the Communist Party is organized. In Bengal, Jyoti Basu was answerable to Pramod Das Gupta. And this is how Murli Manohar Joshi, oh, sorry, Manohar Joshi and Bal Thakre functioned. So what is new? And I would say to him, sorry, Chief Minister is different. The Prime Minister of the country is a Prime Minister of the country. And therefore, it cannot be subordinate to the party president. In fact, this issue came up at the very beginning, and I've recorded it in the book, when Acharya Kripalani, as president of the Congress party, demanded from Nehru access to what government was doing. And, and was refused. Was refused. Nehru told him, become a minister, then I'll tell you what we are up to in government. And thereafter, party presidents were appointed by Nehru and served at Nehru's behest and wishes. Yeah, and then Nindira Gandhi b b b made herself the party president and that tradition continued. Dr. Manmohan Singh unfortunately reversed that relationship. The party president became the supreme person. Yeah. He became subordinate. In a sense, that's not what the constitution intends. The constitution intends the prime minister to be numero uno. Absolutely. The prime minister is the head of the government. He's the leader of the treasury benches in parliament and he represents the country internationally. In agreeing to see himself as subordinate and therefore agreeing to distort what the constitution intends of the role of the prime minister did he have any regrets i mean did he do this with regret or was he simply accepting a reality because the prime ministership in a sense was gifted to him by mrs gandhi and so he knew he hadn't earned it it was a gift she has to therefore be number one well it's interesting in the beginning he was not very comfortable with this role uh, he chafed Yes, he Jeff, and I, I give one example, but you know, I, I know of other examples where he was not too comfortable with uh, being, you know, answerable. But I think over time, and particularly in UPA two, he just was resigned to this reality. There is an instance in your book where, in fact, one of his officials said to him, "Do you think we need to clear this with Sonia Gandhi or whatever?" And his answer is, "I am the Prime Minister." Absolutely, absolutely. But unfortunately, having said it, he didn't act a lot of the time as if he was the Prime Minister. Well, he did act a lot of the times in UPA 1, which, uh, which is the point I make. But, but not UPA 2. Not towards the, yeah, not in UPA 2. Now, in your book, there's a small paragraph on page 36 where you write about Pulak Chatterjee. You mm. say he was inducted into the PMO at Sonia Gandhi's behest. He had daily meetings with her. And then, very carefully you've written, he was said to brief her on key issues of the day and sought her instructions on important files to be cleared by the PM. It sounds as if she sort of used him as a remote control to direct the Prime Minister in whichever direction she wished him to go. I think so. I think there's been a wrong interpretation of this part in the, in the media where people seem to think that I suggest he used to actually carry files to her, etc., which would contravene uh, official secrets. You actions. don't need to carry files exactly. to consult someone. There was a briefing on issues and, and uh, this was not a secret. 
uh, that he would actually meet her and take her views on issues before. And those views would condition quite often the decisions the Prime Minister made yeah. on important subjects. Indeed. And he was therefore the conduit she used mm -hmm. to, how shall I put it in quotations, influence him. That's right. And then there was a formal institution of the National Advisory Council. And Pulok would often attend those meetings. Now, of course, there were instances when Sonia's influence or Sonia's uh, supremacy actually undermined him. You recount in your book how in 2009, just after it was widely believed that he'd won the election for Congress, she offered the finance ministership to Pranab Mukherjee without even informing or consulting the prime minister. He wanted C. Rangarajan, but he simply had to accept what Sonia had done and Rangarajan never got the job. Yes, that is the, my understanding of what happened. I mean, I know for a fact that Rangarajan was sought to be inducted when Chidambaram was moved from finance ministry to home ministry, which was in UPA 1. But uh, I think uh, Mr. Mukherjee then became finance minister in UPA 2. Uh, and at that point, I don't think that was the Prime Minister's first choice. So once again, on a critical question of who will be his finance minister, which many think is the, most, is the second most important job, he was undermined by her. Yes. And in fact, your book says that this deflation of authority, you use that phrase, was something he never recovered from. In your eyes, is it responsible for the fact that in UPA 2, he was a very different prime minister, almost listless and spiritless, compared to what he'd been in UPA 1? Absolutely, Karan. I mean, for me, the moment of truth was when on 2nd June 2009, he actually said to me, that he was willing to sacrifice, he, he had been willing to sacrifice his life for the victory. You know, he had a major heart operation in February 2009, and he had campaigned through the summer months of April, May. And when I said to him that, you know, you, you really went out of your way, he said, I risked my life for the victory. And to me, it appeared that he, he believed that the victory was his. And I do actually think the victory was his. Because you look at the results of 2009, the urban constituencies that went to Mr. Vajpayee in 2004 came to him. Except that Mrs. Gandhi didn't see it that way. And the Congress party believed the victory was hers. And in the way she behaved and the way the Congress party behaved, he was denied credit where it should have been his. Absolutely. And the party was going on saying that victory was due to Rahul Gandhi. I mean, you know. Well, now, this instance that I quoted where Sonia Gandhi offered the Prime Ministership to Pranam Mukherjee without even consulting the Prime Minister, actually thereafter affected the Prime Minister's relationship with Mr. Mukherjee. You write how Mr. Mukherjee would not show drafts of his budget speech to him. Earlier you say that when he was Foreign Minister, he would come back from important visits to America where he'd met George Bush or Condoleezza Rice and forget to brief the Prime Minister. I mean, I take it that was a deliberate slight Pranam Mukherjee was indulging in. Yeah, I guess Mr. Mukherjee thought that he was a senior. After all, he was the boss uh, for Dr. Singh when he was a finance minister and Dr. Singh was the governor of the Reserve Bank. I, I don't think Mr. Mukherjee made a big secret of it. I mean, uh, he did see, think of himself as senior and di therefore directly answerable to the party president rather than the prime minister. In fact, your book mentions how in UPA 1, and presumably this happened in UPA 2, because ministers were actually selected for cabinet by their party chiefs and not by the prime minister, all of them felt they owed their loyalty to their party chiefs. And the prime minister herself was someone that they took almost as if he was an equivalent of theirs. They didn't look up to him. But this is, this is true even in earlier coalitions. I mean, don't forget Vajpayee was called a Mukhauta. And uh, Suresh Prabhu had to be sacked because Bal Thakare wanted him sacked. Except that by the end of Vajpayee's six years, Vajpayee had stamped his authority. Absolutely. That Dr. Manmohan Singh never did. Yes, and I give, I give the credit partly to Mr. Vajpayee, but also partly to Brajesh Mishra, his brilliant principal secretary. Had Dr. Manmohan Singh had a Brajesh Mishra equivalent, he might have come closer to stamping his authority, but the absence of a Brajesh Mishra equivalent further weakened Dr. Manmohan Singh. That's precisely my argument. Now, in your book, you say at one point, I was dismayed by the PM's display of spinelessness. Hmm. It brought to my mind that term that Mr. Advani has repeatedly used. Dr. Manmohan Singh is the weakest Prime Minister India has ever had. Well, I don't know if I would call him weakest because I do think that earlier Prime Ministers like Gowda and Gujral also had very limited freedom to act Rule as Prime those Ministers. Out. What about yeah. full-term Prime Ministers? Well, I think he was certainly the weakest full-term Prime Minister. The weakest full-term Prime yeah. Minister? Yeah. 
A second searingly honest comment in your book is about Dr. Manmohan Singh's personal style and manner and how he used it. You say his shy and self-effacing manner was probably his strategy for political survival. You're suggesting that actually he used his shyness, right? What some people even call his subservience as a way of continuing his hold on office. Yes, this used to be said by a lot of people and I, in fact, as media advisor, I had to often argue against this view, particularly in the media and, and, and react to this. But, you know, the more I heard this kind of a view from commentators, the more I began to ask myself whether there was no, not some element of truth in it. And now you believe there's a considerable element yes, of truth. Yes, indeed. Because this is an important part of your epilogue. Yep. What you're suggesting, or at least so I interpret it, is that there must have been times when Dr. Manmohan Singh gave greater priority to continuing in office yeah. rather than standing up for principle yeah. or even standing up for honor. No, I, I don't think he sacrificed principles. I certainly don't think he sacrificed his honor in the sense that the one issue on which he did stand his ground uh, was on foreign policy. I mean, he did say, and I quote him having said, that I'm not going to allow these communists to dictate Indian foreign policy. And, and he stood his ground with the party. So therefore, words like honor and principle, I'm not sure. I don't think he... What about when Rahul Gandhi rubbished that ordinance in public and said it was complete nonsense? That was a direct hit to the Prime Minister, his authority and his image, and the Prime Minister swallowed it. That was in UPA too. I, but I must add, uh, Karan, for your uh, viewers, that the book is largely about UPA. Absolutely. One, yeah? So this happened in UPA too. There were a few instances when in fact he used his shy and self-effacing manner to continue in office, but not always necessarily at the cost of principle and honor. Come UPA too, what I call a deterioration had happened, and there were instances where he was sacrificing honor to continue in office. Yeah, and in UPA 1, I think the fact that he took such a strong position on the nuclear deal really erased all memory of his not taking a strong position on other issues. That one thing was sufficient to Absolutely. tilt the balance. Absolutely. The public perception at the end of the day was Singh is king. But as someone who saw him at such close quarters and came to the conclusion, perhaps reluctantly, but then fairly convinced of it, that here was a man who at times was using his self-effacing character to continue in office. And that actually, let's use a euphemism, staying in office became important for him. Did he lose respect in your eyes at that point? In UPA 2, yes. In UPA 1, I don't think I saw him as someone who wanted to stay in office. I think he wanted to make a success of his government. He was obsessed about ensuring that the Congress could lead a coalition government through its entire term. But in UPA 2... But in UPA 2, you get the impression that, you know, he just was not willing to stand this, put his foot down and say, I, you know, enough is enough. In UPA 2, he just wanted to continue in office and complete the term. He wanted to complete the term and that became a that, priority. That's the impression. I mean, I, I'm an outsider for UPA 2 as much as you are. So, but the impression from the outside is that. And that's the point at which he diminished in your eyes. Yeah. You lost respect for him. Yeah. You're saying yes. Yes, I mean, uh, I think the, the, I've said it in the book that when he did not quit after the way in which Rahul Gandhi treated him, you know, I, I did lose respect. For now, you're also searingly honest, and some would say, in fact, that searing honesty amounts to a damning indictment of Dr. Manmohan Singh's response to the corruption scandals that surrounded his government, and particularly UPA2. You write, rather than call him blind, I would say that he sometimes chose to close his eyes. He averted his eyes from corruption. That seems as if what you're saying is that he could have acted either to prevent the corruption or at least to tackle it earlier, but consciously chose not to do so. Yes, I, I think um, he may, may have um, understood in his mind the political limitations under which he was working, that he was not in a position to ask either his own party president or the presidents of other uh, coalition partners uh, to remove the ministers that they're assigned to his cabinet and therefore you know he knew that there were limits to his political power incidentally again as i said this was true even in the case of mr vajpai who could uh, you know who didn't want to sack suresh prabhu but was forced to sack but there's him. an interesting argument you're putting across that he knew there were limits to his power hmm. why therefore exercise himself about tackling corruption when he can't therefore it's easier to live with it yes well, that's a sort of faustian that you make with the devil, isn't it? Yes. You say in your book 
that Ratan Tata alerted the Prime Minister to how Dayani Dimaran, who at the time was Telecom Minister, was misusing the Telecom Ministry to favour his brother's media business. And the Prime Minister did absolutely nothing about it. Well, I don't know if he did absolutely nothing because, you know, my job was to always brief him uh, on what was brought to my attention. And I know he was briefed on this particular issue. But whether he acted or not, I would not know. Because if he did act, he would have told his officials and I would not be privy to that. Except that you would have in some way found out about it, presumably. You're, a, you're not just a media advisor, you're a former journalist who gets to know things. True, but I did, I think in that particular case, Maran backed off, Dayanidhi Maran backed off. And finally, of course, he was dropped, I mean, from telecom, if you remember. Your conclusion, mm -hmm. if conclusion is the right word, mm -hmm. for this particular section is to say, he was himself incorruptible mm. and also ensured that no one in his immediate family ever did anything wrong. But he didn't feel answerable for the misdemeanors of his colleagues and subordinates. That's a very strange concept of leadership, isn't it? Leaders actually take responsibility for everyone below them. Dr. Manmohan Singh was willingly saying, I've got nothing to do with those who are corrupt. As long as I'm squeaky clean, let those around me fish in the tank and dirty their fingers. Well, first of all, you know, I, I would give him total credit uh, and a really real genuine credit for actually having kept corruption outside the Prime Minister's office, and both in UPA 1 and UPA 2. I think that was certainly a unique achievement of the Manmohan Singh Prime Ministership, that unlike all previous uh, Prime Ministers, I mean, even in Nehru's time, there were people in the Prime Minister's office charged with corruption. That I grant. But how much discredit does he get for the fact? that not only was he aware that his ministers were indulging in corruption, mm. he did nothing about it mm. and therefore permitted them to continue. Because that's the but that's what I'm it. saying. I think he thought there were political limits. I mean, even if you knew, what could you do about it? So therefore, he did not want to even know. I mean, as I said, say in my book... That's making a virtue out of weakness, isn't it? I can't do it's anything. It's not so a I'm virtue. Not it's just coming to terms with reality. It's coming to terms with reality. Would he not have been a better man if he'd actually made an issue of it? I don't know. I mean, first of all, you know, I think we were working till this whole anti-corruption movement began. We were working in this country in a milieu where people took corruption for granted. Uh, there's some element of corruption in government. So that was not the object of all policy to en eliminate that corruption. That became an issue only after 2010. Two questions follow from this. Firstly, Dr. Manmohan Singh's attitude to corruption suggests that he took it for granted. He didn't see it as such a terrible thing. He was happy for it to carry on because there's nothing he could do about it. But it wasn't in his eyes one of those flashpoints that I have to stand up and resist. He had no great moral attitude to corruption. That's right. That's right. And that's, that's a right. failing in a leader, surely. Well, as I said, he may have taken the view that, look, I mean, this was not the uh, focus of any prime minister before me in a long, long time. But strong leaders stand up for but, against corruption. Well, Weak maybe. leaders <laughs> accept it. No, even strong leaders. I mean, Indira Gandhi was a very strong leader. She accepted a lot of corruption. Rajiv Gandhi was a hugely strong leader, 400 members in parliament. And yet we know of the corruption is in his government. So, you know, I, I guess other prime ministers have tolerated more corruption. The second question that follows is that if he was aware corruption was happening and not doing anything about it, doesn't he in a sense become an accomplice for permitting it to happen? Well, that's, that's what you could say for all prime ministers. But of Dr. Manmohan Singh who are talking about, you can say it. No, as I said, you could say that of all Prime Ministers. So I wouldn't make a special issue out of it just for Dr. Singh. In fact, I would certainly give him credit for ensuring that his family, uh, his own staff were never charged of corruption. But and that's I think, it, isn't it? That's but that's it. important, Karan. That's, that's important it. because that is unique. I mean, he's the only Prime Minister in a long time who didn't have a son-in-law or son is, who was charged of, you know, doing things. This is things. a bit like what they say of Indian social attitudes. As yeah. long as my own house is clean, I don't yeah. mind what filth lies around Maybe the neighbor. so. Maybe so. But at least you made sure his house was clean. All right. <laughs> Finally, in your book, you're also searingly honest about what you describe as Dr. Manmohan Singh's loyalty to the Gandhi family and his commitment or apparent commitment to ensuring that Rahul Gandhi's succession was assured. You say perpetuating the Congress party's control by one family was Dr. Singh's fatal error of judgment. You know, I, I fully understood his loyalty to Mrs. Gandhi during UPA 1 because after all he became Prime Minister because she chose to name him. Though in my book I do argue that she didn't have much of an option, but at least one could say that. 
But I used to disagree with colleagues. In, you know, many of my colleagues used to say to me, oh, but you know, how can he not be loyal to her? He be, he, he, he's PM because of her. And I would say, no, not after 2009. 2009, the Congress party went to the people of India with Manmohan Singh on their manifesto and said, five years of UPA one, this is what we have done. Give us another five years. So you're saying that after 2009, this loyalty to the Gandhi family and this commitment was not to necessary. ensure Rahul's succession was not just unnecessary, you're actually saying it was a fatal error of judgment. Absolutely. The 2009 mandate was for Dr. Manmohan Singh. The 60 additional seats in parliament, that was a victory of Manmohan Singh. And yet he did not claim that victory or he was not allowed to claim that victory. And then the party was so focused on making Rahul Gandhi the prime minister that it virtually subverted. There's it. something else that's inherent in saying this loyalty to the Gandhi family, this commitment to ensuring Rahul's succession is a fatal error of judgment. And that's something else is this, that in committing himself to this, he didn't behave as a democratic prime minister is expected to behave. He behaved like a courtier or a darbari. Well, I mean, that's the implication of, I, I guess, uh, what I've said, though I don't uh, put it in those words. But I, I do think that the, the right thing for him to have done would have been to, in fact, ensure a future for the Congress party as its longest serving Prime Minister after Nehru. That would be independent of one family. Which he didn't do. Which he didn't do. And he had that moment when he could have assured the party's future and in failing to do it, he's done a disservice to the party. Entirely. And this, once again, is a direct consequence. Well, he may not have done a disservice to the party, but he certainly done a disservice to the country because India deserves the uh, Indian National Congress back. It's the party of our national movement. It is not the party of the Gandhi family. And his failure to ensure democratic succession in the Congress party has made it more difficult for the Congress party to return. Well, that the Congress party is finding it difficult to return because of the nature of its current leadership. Let me put this to you. Hmm. Your book is called The Accidental Prime Minister. The truth is that this is actually a term that the Prime Minister himself once used to describe himself. That's right. He would always say to a lot of people, you say, oh, I'm an accidental Prime Minister. I didn't expect to be here. You know, and, and that was true in UPA 1. And the point I make is that was not true in UPA 2. My last point before I take a break. One of the things that emerges, whether you're talking about how Dr. Manmohan Singh viewed his role, accepted that he was subordinate to Sonia, how he behaved in relation to corruption, how he behaved in terms of his commitment to Ra ensuring Rahul's succession. The one thing that emerges from all of this is that he was a weak man. He knew that there were other better things that he should stand up for, but couldn't find it in himself to do it. Weakness is an attribute that he has to accept. Yes, yes. I mean, there were flashes of a sternness in him. There were flashes of resolve and I would always feel heartened seeing those flashes of resolve. There were times he would say, nothing doing, this is what I believe in and I'll do this. But it didn't last long. It wouldn't last long. But whenever he felt like that, you know, one felt proud uh, being next to him. Capable of the occasional flashes of resolve, but more often than not, a weak Prime Minister. Indeed, that will be the verdict of history. Though, as I keep saying, that was not the verdict of UPA 1. All right, but it will be the verdict of history. Of UPA 2. Let's take a break at that point. When I come back, I want to turn and talk to you about the criticism your book has attracted and ask you, how do you respond to it? Dr. Manmohan Singh's former media advisor and now the author of a controversial biography of the Prime Minister, the accidental Prime Minister. Sanjay Baru, the book has attracted adverse comment almost immediately from the PO. They've come up with some stinging criticism. They say it's an attempt to misuse a privileged position and access to high office. Are you guilty of revealing confidential matters or violating the Official Secrets Code? Well, first of all, I'm not guilty of uh, violating the Official Secrets Act. I'm not guilty of violating any confidences where I was told, keep this confidential. I am certainly guilty of sharing a lot of things that I was witness to. And this is a government that passed the Right to Information Act. And for this government to say that sharing what I know as a servant of the people of India in the Prime Minister's office with the people of India, I th I'm amazed at this statement. There's one quotation in your book attributed directly to Dr. Manmohan Singh where he says there cannot be two centers of power. I have to accept that the party president is the center of power. Did you have two thoughts about whether you should use this or not? Did you agonize over it? Because in a sense, 
This is self-incrimination. Yes, I did have uh, two thoughts. I had tremendous agony. Let me tell you, it took me a long time to finish the book because of many things in the book which I was not sure if I should include. Um, I thought about them. I consulted people for whom I have high regard for and trust in. And this is one of those quotations. This was one of those quotations. I did consult people that I have enormous regard for, uh, very, very responsible citizens of the country, and finally decided that people of India should know this. Another quotation in the book is when Dr. Manmohan Singh said to your father, and apparently he said it also quite separately to Mr. Subramaniam, she, meaning Sonia Gandhi, let me down. Well, you know, I, as I mentioned in the book, he said it more in sadness. It was not said in anger. It was in sadness at what happened on the nuclear deal at the Hindustan Times conclave. Now, you agonized over several bits of the book, but at the end of the day, you've included them all. And the PMO says that you are exploiting access for commercial gain. In other words, filthy lucre has been mm -hmm. your motivation. Karan, writing memoirs by people in public life is an old, old tradition. Even in India, I mean, P.C. Alexander, was secretary to Indira Gandhi, wrote a book. Natwar Singh has written recently a book. Lots of uh, uh, retired civil servants have written their memoirs. But in the West, it's very common. But Robert Gates, the defense secretary of Obama, just recently wrote a book after having been defense secretary of the U.S., right? So people in government writing books which educate the public at large about the way in which government functions at the highest levels is a glorious tradition and I don't see it as a, you know going after filthy lucre for heaven's sake I don't need that money <laughs> and when you write a book it has to be the honest book there's of no course. point writing a book and withholding what you know of course though incidentally I have withheld quite a lot but I can say in all honesty so there are some secrets that you will take to your grave there are and absolutely there are secrets I will take to my grave and those are secrets that had they been revealed could have been much more devastatingly embarrassing for either Congress or Dr. Manmohan Singh or whoever. Well, I don't know if they'll be embarrassing or not. They would, have, they would have made me look like someone who's betrayed a confidence because those were told to me in confidence. And therefore, I have not betrayed those confidences. Now, PMO sources are letting it be known that the Prime Minister believes he's been, quotes, stabbed in the back. Mm. What mm -hmm. sense do you have from the Prime Minister or from his wife about how they've responded to this book? I have no sense at all. Uh, and I don't want to comment on, you know, statements given that too by an official of the South Bloc, uh, not even a um, spokesperson of the Prime Minister. So I will leave it at that. Anand Sharma has done an interview where he says that your book is simply fiction. Mm -hmm. He says, you can't possibly know that Sonia Gandhi wanted to offer the job to uh, Pranab Mukherjee without consulting the Prime Minister, that the Prime Minister had preferred Ranga Rajan. You can't possibly know what role Pulak Chatterjee played shuttling between Sonia Gandhi and the Prime Minister. He says this is all fiction. It's simply your word against what he calls the truth. How do you respond to that? Well, I mean, after all, Anand is the Minister of the Government. I don't expect him to say anything different. It's quite interesting. I've had interesting telephone calls from people in the Congress Party um, complimenting me on the book. You know, so I, I, but I that's guess very interesting. So whilst Congress in public is trashing the book in private, they're ringing to all. compliment you. Not all. Some of them, yes, they are complimenting me on the. Do book. you want to name some of them? No, ones? of course not. Of course not. One Congress. But, so, I'm not surprised that some of them make these critical remarks. One Congressman, an official spokesman of the party, Abhishek Singhvi, mm. has publicly said mm. that your book and its timing in particular shows a political motive, and I presume what he's suggesting is that you've written this and released it in the middle of an election to endear yourself to the BJP and Narendra Modi. That's what the Congress spokesperson would say, isn't it? I mean, that's what I would expect them to say. So I'm not surprised that you said that. There's another strain of criticism that's come, not just from the Congress spokesperson, but also from others. They say that you are possibly motivated by what you have yourself called the traumatic events of 2009 mm -hmm. when the Prime Minister asked you to return from a job you had in Singapore offering you another valuable job in Delhi and then on your arrival failed to deliver that job. You know something? It is not about the job because I have had subsequently much, much better jobs. I've been the editor of a newspaper which is a far more exciting and as I quoted the PM himself saying it's a much better job. Except you were <laughs> editor of a paper earlier as well before you joined the PM. Yeah, but you know, I, it's not about the job. There's it's, no spite in this. It's not about the job. It's about trust. There's a betrayal of trust. 
which is more than about not getting a job. What, what people, you know, what, the, the silliness in that statement of those who make this point is as if I was hankering after a job. No, I was seeking trust that was betrayed. That's a very important thing you said. When Dr. Manmohan Singh let you down, he betrayed trust. I felt that way. That must have hurt you deeply. Indeed. Because you looked upon him as a mentor up till then, didn't you? Absolutely. And there were very close family connections. Your father knew him very well personally. Yeah, well, they're not that well and they knew each other, but, but I but certainly Dr. established a relationship where I felt there was a betrayal of trust. How did Ma Dr. Man Dr. Manmohan Singh handle that? He must have known he was betraying his trust, that you well, believed in him and he let you down. I've described that last scene in the book. Uh, I want my viewers, I, I want your viewers to read my book and see for themselves. But it has hurt you and that hurt and that pain is still there. Well, I can see it in your eyes when you talk <laughs> about it. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I can't <laughs> deny that. One last thing. Yeah. Has this book cost you a close relationship with Dr. Manmohan Singh? In the short run, yes. In the long run, I hope not. I hope uh, when he rereads his book in the solitude of his retirement home, he will realize that actually this is the biggest, this is the strongest defense anyone has offered till today of the Prime Ministership of Manmohan Singh. There's just about a month to go when he moves into his retirement home. At that point, will Sanjay Baru, the individual who looked upon Manmohan Singh as a mentor, make some small attempt to reach out to him, to bridge the chasm that may have opened up with this I've book. already made that attempt. I've sought to see him once he's finished reading the book. I'll wait for him to call me and I'll explain to him what were the ideas that went into the book. It's up but to But you're him. going to wait for the phone to ring. You won't ring yourself. No, I w I've sought an appointment, so I'll wait for the phone to ring. But you do want to make up. You do want to restore the relationship. Absolutely. I mean, it's not as if I've written this book to break a relationship. I've written a book in order for people of India to understand the manner in which the Dr. Manmohan Singh functioned as Prime Minister, led this country, offered leadership in a variety of areas, and yet let us all down in by succumbing to this uh, party's, you know, a pressure of, of accepting the Sonia. Big set. And that to his, her son, I mean, this young man, who I don't think has impressed this country at all. The bit that he may found difficult to accept is when you said, let us all down. Yeah. He has to be a big man to accept that, <laughs> doesn't he? Sanjay Baru, a pleasure talking Thanks. to you. Thanks.